the topic of, of my talk is the Old South and the New South. And so <laughs> we all know we're in the New South. I mean, we see it. We don't really know what that is, but people have been talking about it for a long time. Uh, of course, when I came in this morning and we had our continental breakfast, I knew I was in the New South because back in 1977, Hank Williams Jr. wrote a song entitled The New South. And part of that was he didn't want little old Danish rolls. He had to have ham and grits. Well, we didn't have that. Uh, we had Danish rolls. And uh, I remember years ago we had uh, a, a commercial for a Dodge, and it was the truck stop of the New South. And anywhere you go now where uh, the Wall Street is more important than the cotton market, uh, in my own uh, region of Columbus, Georgia, it used to be a textile area, of course, of all the cotton in the area. Now it's banking and finance and insurance. So the South has been made new. And of course, that's an ongoing part of, of Reconstruction. Uh, and the question I always ask my students is, well, what is the New South? What's new about it? If you say there's a New South, then there has to be an Old South. Are they the same or are they different? And so I'm going to talk about the continuity between the two because it's very important to emphasize that. And if you look at many of the prominent Southern political leaders of the early 20th century, even into the mid 20th century, they were very proud of their roots to the Old South. For example, uh, Oscar Underwood of Alabama was descended from a Confederate soldier. He's proud of that. Henry D. Lamar Clayton of Eufaula, Alabama was uh, descended from General Clayton of Eufaula, Alabama, uh, Alabama, who was also the president of the University of Alabama at one point. Uh, from Phoenix City, uh, Albert Love Patterson, who was a very progressive man. He was the man who was actually shot in 1954 uh, after he was elected attorney general uh, to go clean up the city. Uh, he was shot and killed, but the one campaign speech that is out there, he, one of the first things he does is talk about his Confederate ancestors. This was something that you had to do because it was a prerequisite to be elected in the South, and this was, of course, 1954. So people were proud of their history, and some of these people were progressive, all these people really. I mean, Underwood and Clayton were both uh, prominent players in the Woodrow Wilson administration, uh, so they were considered to be fairly progressive. What they were trying to do, though, and I think uh, this is sometimes lost, they were sticking the North with what they stuck with them, right? So they're using the federal machine to get back at the banking industry that had stuck it to the South uh, during Reconstruction. And of course, all this leads into the monuments that we're, we're here talking about today. Uh, almost all of these were built in the New South period. Uh, or not right after the war, but several years later, the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, into the 20th century. And they were wrestling with the same issues that we're talking about today. And I'm going to read you some quotes, and you're going to think to yourself, my gosh, here we are over 100 years later, and we're still saying the same things because the same process is ongoing. Now, I actually purloined the title of my talk from a commencement address when they actually gave real ones uh, by a man named John Randolph Tucker before the uh, South Carolina College in 1887. So John Randolph Tucker was in direct line to St. George Tucker, the famous constitutional scholar who dined with, uh, with Thomas Jefferson. Even then, there was some discussion about the meaning of the Old South and the cause for which Tucker, who did serve in the Confederate government, and other Southerners fought between 1861 and 1865. Of course, today we stand in the shadow of Davis and Lee and Jackson at Stone Mountain Park, three men who stood in the shadow of their forefathers and the cause for which they bled between 1775 and 1783. There is a connection. The media has labeled these men and others traitors and branded their cause in 1861 as un-American. It was a perversion of the American tradition of self-government. Lincoln said so himself because the Union was fighting for a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, which we know is not true. They would have you believe that every Confederate soldier was simply dropped onto planet Earth in 1861 from some alien spacecraft. These people aren't American. Their America was the peculiar other in the world in 1861. The diversion from good, honest government sustained by good, quote unquote, honest men like Abraham Lincoln, Charles Sumner, Thad Stevens, and Benjamin Wade. We all know how honest they were. 
course, this narrative lacks historical understanding. And more importantly, is a thinly veiled attempt to destroy the American principles that supported the cause in 1861. It's not racism or slavery, for the North could not claim that it was the happy land of egalitarianism. Simply read the statements of Lincoln himself. But the Jeffersonian, by default, American tradition of government set forth in the Declaration of Independence, codified by the Articles of Confederation, ratified by the several states in 1787 and 1788 in the U.S. Constitution, destroyed by the Nationalists in the antebellum period, and resurrected by the Confederate States Constitution of 1861. It finally died a painful death at Appomattox in 1865, but the principles and traditions are still alive. They are alive because we're here. Of course, this doesn't mean that any of these documents were perfect. Far from it. And the Nationalists exposed the inherent weakness of the Constitution for the United States. But each contained the seeds planted by the concluding paragraph of the Declaration. We know that the Declaration said that we had free and independent states equal to the state of Great Britain. Jefferson chose that word on purpose, right? It wasn't a province or a shire or a county. It was a state. The South germinated those seeds, nurtured their saplings, and then enjoyed the shade of those vital oaks longer than the North, a section that then poisoned them slowly over many years until the South believed that new seeds needed to be planted, seeds that reflect the Jeffersonian American tradition. Confederate monuments and symbols are under attack because they represent the perpetuation of the Jeffersonian tradition of self-government in a decentralization. That's really the underlying theme. We cannot let the other side deflect the issue and reduce the cause to a simple defense of race and slavery. This is a juvenile response to a complex question, and it ignores the great foundation of the Southern tradition, one that was formed when Sir Walter Raleigh financed the first English attempt to settle the New World in the 16th century. To them, to these Englishmen, the New World was a God-given utopic environment of riches for those who had the energy and activity to manage them. In contrast, New England writers spoke of a dark and foreboding wilderness, a primitive place that had to be survived, not utilized. They ate stale brown bread, cold baked beans, and drank apple cider, while Virginians dined on the bountiful crops of their fruitful harvests. Southern optimism was tested by Reconstruction, but the monuments erected by the UDC and other groups showed that the spirit which animated them in 1861 was never choked out by the boot, just as the optimism of those early settlers was never crushed by a harsh environment. And so what was the cause for which these men fought for in 1861? Well, if you read the monu monuments themselves, they tell you what it was. And a cursor review lets us know that. So from Columbus, Georgia, the, Co the Confederate Monument in Columbus, Georgia, it says, quote, to honor the Confederate soldiers who died to repel unconstitutional invasion, to protect the right reserved to the people, and to perpetuate forever the sovereignty of the states. From Austin, Texas, died for states' rights guaranteed under the Constitution the people of the South, animated by the spirit of 1776 to preserve their rights, withdrew from the Federal Compact in 1861. The North resorted to coercion. The South, against overwhelming numbers and resources, fought until exhausted. From R Richmond County, Georgia, these men died in defense of the principles of the Declaration of Independence. From Augusta, Georgia, for the honor of Georgia, for the rights of the states, for the liberties of the South, for the principles of the Union, as these were handed down to them by the fathers of our common country. And finally, from St. Louis, Missouri, to the memory of the soldiers and sailors of the Southern Confederacy who fought to uphold the right declared by the pen of Jefferson and achieved by the sword of Washington. With sublime self-sacrifice, they battled to preserve the independence of the states, which was won from Great Britain, and to perpetuate the constitutional government, which was established by the fathers. 
That's what they were fighting for. Now, critics have charged that this is the worst sort of historical revisionism, that the Declaration of Independence could never be invoked by a people so dedicated to undermining its stated proposition that all men are created equal. Anyone with even a few minutes of time and energy would find that countless men across the South believe they were advancing the cause of their fathers in 1861. After all, the Declaration of Independence was not a proposition document, but a political call for action, meaning independence, that followed the format of the English Bill of Rights of 1689. Jefferson himself stated that the Declaration contained no new social theories, but simply express the American mind of the time. The most important phrases, of course, of the Declaration are often overlooked. We focus on that one line, and people run with it. But you go to the last paragraph, which is the most important, and it proves conclusively what that document was all about. Now, Jefferson's own descendants served in the Confederate government. His grandson was a brigadier general and secretary of war. Just about any Southerner of note from the founding generation had a descendant who served in the Confederate military or the Confederate government. Lee was descended from Light Horse Harry Lee, Washington's most trusted cavalry officer during the American War for Independence. He was also married to George Washington's great-granddaughter. James Madison, James Monroe, John Taylor of Caroline, St. George Tucker, George Mason, Andrew Pickens, all the Hamptons of South Carolina, the Pendletons and Nelsons of Virginia, the Stevenses of Georgia, the Bees of South Carolina, the Breckenridges of Virginia and Kentucky, the Boones, the Crockett's and Clarks of Virginia, all of these people had descendants who fought for the South. The list is nearly endless. Jefferson Davis's father fought in the American War for Independence. So he was not speaking out of turn when he said to the Senate in 1861 that his duty was to preserve the heritage that had been handed down to him by his father and send it to future generations. That heritage was independence. And even a few Northerners of famous, famous lineage supported the South. John Hancock's great nephew fought for the Confederacy, as did Matthew Lyon's grandson. Now, Lyon is not so well known, but Lyon was the guy who was arrested in Connecticut for violating the famous Sedition Act of 1798. He actually ran for Congress while he was in jail and was elected. There used to be good Connecticuters. And this says nothing of President John Tyler, who served in the Confederate Congress. He dined with his father at Jefferson's table as a boy. Perhaps, though, the best summary of the direct lineage from the early Federal Republic to the war in 1861 came from the pen of, pen of Richard Taylor, the son of war hero and 12th president, Zachary Taylor. Taylor's response at the conclusion of the war to a recent German immigrant turned Union soldier outlined his understanding of history and traditional American principles, principles the South defended and exemplified. This unnamed German, quote unquote, comforted Taylor by assurances that we of the South would speedily recognize our ignorance and errors, especially about slavery and the rights of states, and rejoice in the results of the war. Taylor then apologized for, quote unquote, meekly defending his ignorance on the ground that my ancestors had come from England to Virginia in 1608 and in the short intervening period of 250 odd years had found no time to transmit to me correct ideas of the duties of American citizenship. The German officer simply smiled and offered to instruct Taylor whenever needed. Finding foreigners in the service of the blue was not uncommon. The great American writer Ambrose Bierce once complained that he was the only Union soldier who spoke English in his POW camp during the war. Irishmen, Swedes, Germans were offered bounties and meals once they jumped off the boat if they would simply go south and fight the Confederates. The North made up for a lack of enthusiasm for the war by utilizing the large numbers of foreign immigrants that arrived in their harbors on a daily basis. If it could not acquire soldiers that way, it offered large bounties for enlistment or simply conscripted them. The historian William Marvel has done a nice job showing the financial motivation for many New Englanders during the early days of the war. It was a job. 
and they could get money for it. And of course, the draft sparked riots in New York and Wisconsin, while enrollment agents often found it hard to locate men of military age when they came calling in the North, particularly in the so-called border states. Uh, in Delaware, for example, large numbers of men who could have been drafted into service were listed as missing or sick and hidden by their relatives. That was draft dodging at its best. Of course, this does not mean there were no foreigners who supported the Confederate cause. Many did. But the overwhelming majority came from American stock that traced its lineage to the earliest settlers in North America. That's the continuity. As I said before, many of these monuments that are now under attack were erected during our New South period of history. This has been labeled the era of the lost cause, a complete revision of history that distorted the true meaning and nature of the war. In fact, it was during this time that the wounds of the war were finally being healed and the bitter attacks leveled at Southerners were abating in the North, not entirely, but somewhat. The Grover Cleveland administration, for example, was the first to attempt to set aside these sectional feelings and incorporate the South into the new Union. And very famously, you know, Cleveland always denied he had any role in this, but there was a famous rebel flag order where the confiscated Confederate flags were, were to be returned to the South. And the Grand Army of the Republic balked at that, and Cleveland had to rescind the order. <clears throat> uh, Reconstruction policies were denounced in both the North and South as unconstitutional invasions of self-government. Southerners were finally free to honor the men who had fought for Jeffersonian principles of self-determination. There were still some attacks from Northern pens. Then as now, the South was the punching bag for the delusional self-righteous Yankee. It's a disorder, by the way. During a Confederate Memorial Day celebration in Columbus, Georgia in 1898, Judge Henry R. Goethes hammered this point home, and I'm going to read you his quote. But history furnishes no sublimer evidence of patriotism and love of country than was exhibited by the noble men of whom we speak today. The most execrated of all men by his fellow citizens and by his posterity is he who betrays his country. And the most honored of men is he who falls a blessed martyr to his country's cause. It was a common thing for the enemies of the South to charge against Southern soldiers the infamous crime of rebellion, and they were branded as traitors. At the close of hostilities, the president of the Confederacy was thrown into chains and into prison to be made a vicarious sacrifice for the sins of his people. And it was intended that he should be hung Similar steps were taken, happily not consummated, to incarcerate the leader of the Confederate armies. Partaking of this bitter and revengeful feeling, the historians of the North have written and printed and have industriously circulated histories containing these charges. Their books are today, in 1898, sold in your cities, admitted into your homes, and taught in your schools. In your own state of Georgia, and until recently in this patriotic city, which has contributed so much blood and treasure and blessed memory to the Southern cause, the children are being allowed to understand that the cause of the Confederacy was the cause of traitors, and that those who fought for it were rebels. Can these things be, and we remain silent in 1898? Just one year prior, another Confederate veteran named John Cussens wrote of his fear of the future with the prevailing Northern interpretation of the war saturating history textbooks across the United States, but particularly in the South. He said this, our grandchildren trained in the public schools often mingle with their affection an indefinable pity, a, path a pathetic sorrow solacing us with their caresses while vainly striving to forget our crimes. A bright little girl climbs into the old veteran's lap and hugging him hard and kissing his gray beard exclaims, I don't care, Grandpa, if you are an old rebel. I love you. He later wrote, The whole story of the war and its causes has been distorted and perverted and falsely told. 
Yet at the bar of unbiased history, before the tribunal of impartial posterity, it will become manifest that the vital principle of self-government, the world's ideal, and what we fondly deemed American, America's realization of that ideal, went down in blood and tears on the stricken field of, Appom of Appomattox. It was there that statehood perished. It was there that the last stand was made for the once sacred principle of government by free consent. The culprit in all this, of course, to Cousins was the Yankee, whom Cousins defined as a self-styled apostle of liberty. He has ever claimed for himself the liberty of persecuting all who presume to differ from him. Self-appointed as the champion of unity and harmony, he has carried discord into every land that his foot has smitten. Exalting himself as the defender of freedom of thought, his favorite practice has been to muzzle the press and to adjourn legislators, legislatures with the sword. Vaunting himself as the only true disciple of the living God, he has done more to bring sacred things into disrepute than has been accomplished by all the apostates of all the ages, <clears throat> from Judas to Robert G. Ingersoll. Born in revolt against law and order, breeding schism in the church and faction in the state, seceding from every organization to which he has pledged fidelity, nullifying all law, human and divine, which lack the seal of his approval, evermore setting up what he calls conscience against the moral august of constituted authority and the most sacred of uh, covenanted obligations. He yet has the impregnable conceit to pose himself in the world's eye as the only surviving specimen of political or moral worth. That is the same thing that we're facing today. Now, Southerners fought back with no less ardor than they displayed during the four years of hostility. By 1906, the Southern cause was fully embraced in Washington, D.C. as President Teddy Roosevelt, for all of his faults, ordered confiscated battle flags to be returned to their Southern homes. He himself even acknowledged his own Confederate roots. His mother was from Georgia and an ardent, unreconstructed Southern lady. To Roosevelt, Southern symbols were as American as those found in the North among Union veterans. And our third talk today is going to discuss that. Even Southerners who embraced the tenets of the New South reverently spoke of the old. And that's important. You can embrace the new, but you never forget the old. Henry Grady, perhaps the most conspicuous advocate of a New South, said in his famous 1886 speech, in New York City, that in speaking to the toast with which you have honored me, I accept the term the New South, as in no sense disparaging to the old. Dear to me, sir, is the home of my childhood and the traditions of my people. I would not, if I could, dim the glory they won in peace and war, or by word or deed take aught from the splendor and grace of their civilization. Never equaled, and perhaps never to be equaled, in its chivalric strength and grace. There is a new South, not through protest against the old, but because of new conditions, new adjustments, and if you please, new ideas and aspirations. The continuity of the old South, the new, has been manifested longer in the political traditions than any other trait that comes out of Southern civilization. John Randolph Tucker, who I'll read another quote from him in a minute, called the inductive philosophy of, in political science the peculiar product of Southern thought. His father was Henry St. George Tucker, and his grandfather was St. George Tucker. John Randolph Tucker's son would serve in the Congress and was one of the best legal minds in the United States into the 20th century. And if you're so inclined, uh, a few months ago I ran a week-long dedication to the Tuckers, which contains several articles from their pen. It was uh, including one from John Randolph Tucker's son, uh, Henry St. George Tucker, uh, which was delivered in uh, the early 20th century in refutation of the general welfare clause or what you know, the sweeping interpretation of it. St. George Tucker wrote the first comprehensive treatise on the Constitution after its ratification. His unequivocal support for what is often labeled the Conplac theory underscores the Jeffersonian position of decentralization and federalism. We should not concede the field. It is a compact fact 
not a compact theory. Tucker, of course, dined with Jefferson, and the Tuckers remained a legal force in Virginia for generations. Henry St. George Tucker and Nathaniel Beverly Tucker both carried the mantle of Jeffersonian republicanism through both legal studies and literature. And one cannot forget that John Randolph of Roanoke was St. George Tucker's stepson. It seems good ideas never die, and the Southern tradition most eloquently and beautifully preserved in the Southern symbols and monuments that are under attack today are a reminder of true American statesmanship and manly resolve. Just by saying manly, that should be a trigger warning. Now, why do we need to remember our tradition and correct the perversions that whisper from the forked tongue mouths and seep from the wicked pens of the cultural Marxists? Because our very existence means that the Southern tradition can survive. And if the Southern tradition survives, then the American tradition survives. John Custon said in 1897 that a people which takes no pride in the noble achievements of a remote ancestry will never achieve anything worthy to be remembered by remote descendants. And John Randolph Tucker implored the men of South Carolina College to remember the past, and this is his quote. I would love to hear this kind of commencement address. Let us then be done with self-crimination and recrimination. From the misfortunes, faults, and mistakes of the Old North and the Old South, let us discern and rescue the truth buried under the wreck and rubbish of war and revolution and exhuming it as precious seed for the civilization of the New South. Do honor to the heroic martyrdom of our dead and cling to the principles which they died as the everlasting memorial of their great names and as the priceless heritage of our latest posterity. I would today, my young brothers, like old mortality, efface from the moss-grown tombs of our old and buried South the stains which defile them, and restore and deepen with my unskilled hand the inscriptions that truth has chiseled there as tributes to their genius and their statesmanship, to their moral virtues and their martial heroism. The new South and the glory of its progress and wealth and material prosperity will be unworthy of these gifts of providence and will merit only the contempt of mankind when it shall ever learn to reject the profound political philosophy of Jefferson, Madison, Rutledge, the Pinckneys, and Calhoun, or turn with irreverent indifference, irreverent indifference from the tombs of Robert Lee, Sidney Johnston, and Stonewall Jackson. Without detracting from the well-earned fame of northern statesmen and soldiers, but yielding to them a just and generous admiration, let us never shrink into the sloth of servile self-humiliation on the one hand, or of obsequious, fulsome, and, flattering, and fawning flattery on the other. The North pays fit homage to its mighty dead in monuments of marble and bronze. Let us take care to mark with honorable memorials the graves which cover the ashes of our sages, patriots and heroes who are the peers of any who have ever appeared in the history of mankind. That is why we are here. Our defense must heed those words and our defense has to begin here and we cannot forget this as the attacks continue to come against us. Thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen.